Okay, we're going to get in the presentation of the, uh, of the meeting this evening, and it's going to take on about three levels. I have four or five representatives of the industry. Uh, their remarks are not going to be long. They're going to be rather aggressive, uh, very pointed. We're going to tie the thing together in a rapid, uh, hard-hitting thing. Then I want to summarize what the program means to us, what our responsibilities are to go, and then how the industry unified can actually make the whole thing work in 78, because that is our goal. That's what we're here for. That's what I'm employed for. There's no other reason for me to be standing in front of you today than the fact that I have to develop a cost of production program for you. That's why I'm bringing these people to you this afternoon, and we've got a quite a hodgepodge of people here but they've all been brought here for a special reason to tie, uh, to tie this thing together. I'd like to call on Dean Caperno from Watt Publishing Company. Dean. Thank you, Alan. I suppose I should say, can you hear me? And then if you say you can, back up or something like that. So, uh, <clears throat> And he also put me on the wrong end of the program because uh, if he wants the program to move fast because Tuesday morning I became a grandfather and I could talk for about an hour and a half about that grandchild so uh, maybe you better have me sit down right now. <laughs> now we at Watt, uh, many of you may remember Watt Publishing Company as the publishing company that has produced over the years Poultry Tribune and a few other the poultry magazines. But about seven years ago, okay, can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. So about seven years ago, we, we came out and produced a magazine called Pig International, reaching the total hog, uh, hog producing areas in all the world. In other words, uh, we, we distribute Pig International in Europe, in Asia, South America, Africa, everywhere that hogs are produced outside of North America. Then we, uh, about two years ago, decided that the uh, hog producers in North America were not quite getting what we felt they deserved as far as publication to serve the pork producers. And so we, we with the same people in the editorial department, started producing a magazine called Pig American. And Pig American is distributed to you producers in the in, uh, uh, United States and Canada. Uh, one of the things I think is important to you is the fact that, that uh, our editorial people are both English. They, they live in England and have the ability and the uh, structure in their contacts and so forth to, to bring to us here in the country, in the United States, all sorts of information that is, that is uh, available to them in, from producers in all of Europe, which many of you know uh, that the Europeans are, are way out in front of us as far as, as developments in production and, and other facets of, of uh, swine. So uh, Mr. Best and uh, Mr. Phelps are the people that we look to for editorial leadership. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to uh, emphasize, and Mr. Staley in his speech last night pointed out, Alan again too, that we're looking at somewhere between 50 and 55,000 pork producers that produce most of the hogs, like you know 95% plus of the hogs in the United States. And so, since we have presently at least 41,000 of them on our mailing list, we have a very important role to play in, in bringing you information that is useful, information that can help you develop your program better, and, uh, and we are taking this very seriously. Uh, as Alan indicated, we we're, would more than invite you, if you're not receiving our publication now, to uh, fill out a card that will be at the hog, uh, hog desk tomorrow in, here in the auditorium 
and, uh, we, and Alan will see that the publication information gets to us and we'll put you on our mailing list. I don't want to take a lot of time, as I say, my, most, my biggest speech is about my grandson, and uh, I won't get into that. We do ap really appreciate the uh, uh, advertisement that National Farmers Organization is putting in our publication. We will work as closely as we can to help you uh, develop and improve that uh, method of spreading the information you want to get around. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to speak to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. The next man that's going to talk to you for just a, a few minutes is the National Director of Market Relations for the National Pork Producers. Now, Within our own company, or within our own organization, we have many companies that have taken the 10 cents per hundred weight. Many of you have asked about that 10 cents per hundred weight and what it goes for, where it goes, and how it all comes about. Now, uh, Dan here is in position to explain to you what they do with the merchandising end of this thing. He's not in position to give you any information as far as their total budget and their total distribution. We must recognize in this that I think it's our responsibility to bring this, this program to you to show you what type of thing is happening. I also think it's necessary from the position of director of your department that we bridge some of these gaps and develop a working relationship, whether we agree or not, uh, with their 10 cents per hundred weight, whether or not we agree doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. I think we owe it to ourselves to know where it goes because a lot of the companies have worked with them and that's the reason that I brought uh, the uh, director from the the pork producers uh, to your convention to talk to you for a, f a few minutes and show you one example of the type of thing that they had set up. So at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Dan Hoffman, National Pork Producers. Thank you very much. It, it is a pleasure, an opportunity to, to be with you folks today. He's a little bigger. Thank you. Thank you. It, it uh, reminds me of a very short story. It, it uh, reminds me of the, the baby's diaper. You know, it, uh, it may not show on the outside the warmth of the feeling that, that I have for being here with you, but it gives you the nice warm feeling on the inside. <laughs> before, before I talk about the promotion or as Mr. Scrow said, where the dime and the nickel go, I'd like to spend a half a minute explaining the history of the National Pork Producers Council. It is headquartered in Des Moines, Iowa, and the NPPC is dedicated to helping pork producers produce an abundant supply of wholesome, nutritious pork for consumers at a fair and reasonable profit. Our membership is made up of more than 80,000 producers from 35 member states. The organization was organized in 1954. It wasn't until 1968, however, when the Nickel for Profit program was in initiated, the fundraising program and promotional programs, that an impact and effect began to take shape. The Nickels for Profit was a voluntary investment program where producers deducted a nickel from each hog marketed. In 1976, producers decided to increase this voluntary investment program to a dime per head for a market hog, and then they went to the nickel per head for the feeder pig on a voluntary basis. Now more than 1,800 markets across the country participate in this market investment program. A portion of each nickel and dime is used to fund state pork producer organization activities. The balance is invested by the NPPC in a variety of nationwide pork promotional and educational programs, plus production and related research. 
Membership dues are coll collected by local pork producer groups as a source of funds for the county and local organizations. At this time, I would like to go to an audiovisual presentation that was used in two of our recently opened image cities, Chicago and the Cleveland Akron area, which we call an image city metropolitan market. If I could have whatever lights. One additional comment, there was a film used in connection with this. Buttons are nice, but there's a lot more to promoting pork than being in the button business. So the National Pork Producers Council carries out a number of wide-ranging promotion efforts each year because it's our job to help our 80,000 members promote one of nature's most naturally good products, today's new pork. Today's pork is better. It's leaner, more tender, and nutritious. And to make sure American consumers know about today's new pork, 80% of the funds voluntarily invested by pork producers is used in promotion and advertising at the Pork Council. Pork Council advertising and promotion is directed at heavily populated areas. Year-round campaigns are conducted in markets that account for 45% of the U.S. food store sales. Heavy emphasis is placed on newspapers. The ads feature easy-to-prepare pork recipes. The ads are placed on the same day food stores run their ads. That way, consumers are reminded to put pork on their shopping lists. A special ad was designed last November to test the drawing power of the papers utilized by the Pork Council. The ad offered the 32-page Pork Just for the Joy of Eating recipe booklet, which was developed by the NPPC staff. The results from the ad were fantastic. More than 26,000 consumers requested the booklet by sending a self-addressed stamped envelope to our office. During the year, thousands of requests are received by the Pork Council for the latest information on pork selection, preparation, and cookery. Retailers and packers are advised of upcoming Pork Council promotional programs through a special newsletter. The January issue told about NPPC's sponsorship in the Woman's Day James Beard Creative Cookery Contest. The Pork Council was one of 12 participants in the contest. Contestants had to use one of the participants' products in their original recipes. Top prize in the contest was a week-long expense-paid trip for two to New York City and a course at the James Beard Cooking School. The magazine went on sale in mid-February to over eight and a half million consumers. The NPPC featured the contest in a 600-line ad during its February national newspaper schedule. The results from the contest were even better than expected. In fact, pork recipes were the second most popular with over 2,600 entries. The top 100 pork recipes from the contest have been put into a super 112-page pork recipe book. The book is now ready for distribution. In March, our promotional newsletter advised retailers and packers of a summer cookout promotion. The campaign included a solid national newspaper and magazine schedule, plus an extensive in-store promotional effort. A brochure explaining details of the promotion was sent to over 2,000 packers and retailers in March. The brochure offered a free in-store promotion kit, plus other pork merchandising aids. The promotional kit included two full-color posters. The chef at the grill set the outdoor cooking theme. And this poster sold the sizzle with several different pork cuts. Packers and retailers ordered over 86,000 of these posters. The kit also contained 10 meat case strips with five featured cuts and five blank meat case strips so retailers could write in specific pork cookout specials. The Pork Council also offered theme art and special map books for newspaper ads. To induce consumers to shop their meat departments for their favorite pork cuts, six 500-line ads were placed in over 65 major newspapers across the country. The first ad presented the outdoor theme, and the other five featured recipes for outdoor cooking. Five of the most popular magazines featuring recipes and outdoor living were used in the magazine schedule. 
In June, one half page ads appeared in Woman's Day, American Home, Southern Living, Weight Watchers, and Sunset. The newspaper and magazine ads offered the All American Pork Cookout book free to those readers who sent a self addressed stamped envelope to the Pork Council. More than 41,000 requests for the booklet came into the NPPC office. During June, July, and August, the promotion was seen by more than 85 million consumers. Up to that time, it was the largest such promotion ever conducted by a commodity group. And it got consumers all across the country this summer thinking summer cookouts a breeze with pork. In past years, the National Pork Cookout Contest was held at the American Pork Congress, our annual producer meeting. But the only people who got to see the contest were pork producers and agribusiness people. So it was decided to move the contest to an image city and turn it into a major promotion event. With this in mind, the nation's best outdoor pork chefs gathered in St. Louis June 10th and 11th to demonstrate their skill. And here's how it went. This is where we ran the film. Stand by places. <laughs> And right behind all this activity comes the annual October Pork Fest campaign, even bigger than the summer cookout promotion. Retailers and packers learned about our plans through a special brochure mailed to them in August. Pork Fest features an extensive in-store promotional effort, including meat case strips and posters. In fact, nearly 200,000 posters have been ordered by packers and retailers. A month-long newspaper ad schedule in 65 cities will tell consumers about pork, plus offer the cookbook of top 100 recipes from the Women's Day James Beard Creative Cookery Contest. Consumers will send 25 cents and a price weight label from a pork purchase to get the cookbook. Radio spots will run in 25 major markets. They feature original music and tie-in with local retail ads. Take a listen. Today's new pork is leaner, more tender, and higher in protein. And the ways you can fix it are limited only by your imagination. Fresh cured, smoked, or canned, ribs, chopped steaks, loins, ham, bacon, and sausage. All available from your favorite supermarket. Pork is a good source of B vitamins and is great for your weight reducing program. Only 70 calories per ounce, same as two pats of margarine. And it's 98% digestible for a greater variety of good tasting nutrition. Serve pork. All across the land, there's a new pork growing. Tender love and fair. Brought to you by the National Pork Council. Pork's a thing that's people pleasing, tasty and tender and hunger easing, easy fixing and always in season and 98% digestible. Pork's the one that's a sheer delight and you can serve it morning, noon, and night and smell it cooking. It's out of sight. Got a whole lot of B1 vitamins. Pork's a thing that's got four wheels and the more you eat, the better you feel and budget wise it's a real good deal with a big variety of cuts. Well, it's pork. I was just kidding you about the wheels. But we ain't kidding you about these deals. Listen. Apple sauce and pork chops. What better way to welcome a crisp fall evening? And this week you'll find super savings on both these all-American products at your local supermarket. And while at the market, check out the other great pork values at the meat counter. Pork chops, pork roasts, pork steaks, pork burgers, you name it, we've got it. Pork, an all-American meat for October Pork Fest. My poetry might not have been the best, but take a look at the Fall Pork Fest from the National Pork Council. You know, the warmth and security of being a child can be remembered in many different ways. Favorite places you played, friends you had, special things mom or dad would do for you, like the smell of pork cooking. It filled the whole house with a friendly aroma that even years later can take you right back to when you were a kid. It was one of the special things your folks did for you. Pork chops cooking or a ham or pork roast in the oven or sizzling bacon and eggs made it easier to leave the important work of playing outdoors or to roll out of a warm bed on a chilly morning. Wouldn't it be great to be a kid again, just for an hour or so? Well, it can come close with tender mouthwater and pork from your favorite supermarket. It'll taste like it did then, even better. 
It's new pork, leaner and more tender and better tasting. Pork is economical, and the memories are on us. We're the National Pork Council. Full page four color ads are running in major women's magazines. These ads alone have a potential readership of 71 million consumers. And like the newspaper ads, they also offer the winning ways of pork cookbook. In addition, national pork TV spots will appear on all major network game shows. There you have it, a year packed full of pork promotional activities. But does all of this promotion do any good? In 1976, pork production was up 9%. However, pork in cold storage was down 9% from the same period a year ago. Pork was moving, and we think we had a hand in that movement. But it was only possible through the cooperation of packers and retailers such as yourselves. That's the real purpose of all our promotion activity, the retail movement of pork, and at the same time, generating cooperation for the mutual benefit of all segments of the pork industry. And our 80,000 producer members look forward to joining hands with you in this never-ending effort. Okay, that, uh, in, in a very short capsule-type form, pretty well explains the investment program of the National Pork Producers Council in, in promoting a pork product. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a couple things happening here that I'm going to have to ask for some patience on your part. I'm going to have to leave the meeting here for a few minutes, and I want to tell you why. The Secretary of Agriculture has come into the uh, town. He's going to speak to you this evening. We have a problem in the pork industry that is something we've got to recognize and deal with. It's got to do with some of the statements that were made by the department concerning the use of nitrite in meat. If these statements continue in the manner that they have been uh, made and we cause the, the price of, of hogs to go down in relation to what this uh, type of thing has done to the price of bacon, we're in some serious problems. Now, on that basis, the industry stands to lose literally millions of dollars, and that folks, is going to come out of the producer's pocket. Now, I asked for an appointment for the Packer representatives that were here and for myself to explain our position and what the dollars and cents uh, factors would be as far as, as uh, the impact on your industry. Because if you're looking at a $28 market uh, based on the futures, based on the supply-demand thing that you have thrown at you, and then you turn around and knock another $10 off because it's uh, made illegal or you put a ban on the sale of bacon and products, we're in some real problems. So what I'm going to do here is I want to introduce uh, uh, Joe Dorfman from Frederick Pack, who will talk to you for just a few minutes, and then we're going to go over and meet with the Secretary of Agriculture, and I should be back here in about 15 minutes and we should have a pretty good impact on what he says. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Joe Dorfman, who is the Vice President of the Fresh Pork Division in Frederick Packing, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, thank you, Alan, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you first <clears throat> for inviting me to attend your convention this year. I'm sure very few of you have ever heard of Frederick and Herod. Uh, so I'll briefly tell you what we, what we do. Uh, primarily, we are hog slaughterers in the city of Detroit. Uh, we are slaughtering presently the neighborhood of 15,000 head a day right in the city itself. And so we're one of the few packers that are not located out here where all the livestock are. And that presents some serious problems for us in, in many ways. Uh, we are presently 
uh, buying animals from the NFO. Uh, we wish to continue the, the successful relationship that we've had in the past year or so. And in fact, we wish to expand and attempt to buy hogs in greater numbers from all of you. Uh, we have one problem that is of great significance to us with respect to buying additional animals, and that is we require the, the highest quality animals in the country. Uh, we buy nothing but ones and twos. We buy nothing but animals in the range of 210 to 230 pounds. Uh, we do this because we are in the business of supplying retailers and processors with the highest quality fresh pork cuts available. Our product is special trim product. Uh, it is very lean product, uh, which is desirable from the standpoint of the consumer and from the standpoint of the processor for two reasons. The appearance of the product and in terms of processing, uh, the yield of the product itself is considerably better. Uh, we also operate processing plants in which we buy hams from other operators throughout the country and we spend a great deal of time comparing yields from hams that we produce at our own plants and those that we have to buy from other producers in the country. And there's no question that our hams, uh, because of their leanness, because of their trim, uh, are significantly higher yielding and therefore our raw meat cost is significantly lower than some others in the industry. Now the only way that you can produce the kind of product that we want to produce is through the purchase of the raw materials that are acceptable. Uh, we, can, we can't take uh, threes and fours and try to produce special trim product. It just doesn't work that way. So our, our one message that we'd like to get across to you is that we're prepared to buy animals from the NFO. We'd like to buy more animals. But we cannot put ourselves in a position of buying run-of-the-mill type hogs. We want to buy the highest quality animals. We want to pay for those animals. Uh, we don't want to, to pay for threes and fours and expect to get ones and twos. We want to pay the value uh, for the ones and twos, but we must get the quality animals so that we can survive and also so that you're able to survive. The one problem that Alan also alluded to uh, that we are going to meet with Secretary Berglund in regard to is this problem that this alleged problem, I should say, uh, that deals with nitrites being used for curing bellies in order to produce bacon. Uh, it appears to me that there are people in Washington who have acted in a somewhat irresponsible manner with regard to this nitrate uh, situation in, in, uh, which is used in the formation of bacon. Uh, what they've tried to do is create a situation in which uh, they are claiming that if you eat 40,000 pounds of bacon every day for the rest of your life, that there is a chance that there may be carcinogenic agents that will form. Now, that doesn't frighten me too much. Uh, even if I were physically able to consume 40,000 pounds, I couldn't afford it. Uh, the, other, the other side of that coin is, uh, do we really want to spend our time and energy concerned about something as ridiculous as that? Um, if I were to tell you that drinking 10,000 glasses of water might drown you, would that, would that uh, have an impact on you to consider banning the use of water? I don't think so. I think you would think us foolish to start to ration water and give everybody three glasses a day for fear you might drown yourself. Well, that's, that seems to be the mentality that we're having to deal with in Washington today. And it's a threat to our existence as bacon slicers. It's a threat to your existence as hog producers because not only will significant numbers of people be put out of work, but you too will have to get lesser values for your hogs. There's no question that for the short run, pork bellies, if bacon is banned, will be used as trimmings, but there's no assurance that the trimmings will be able to be consumed in sausage products. And so the net effect will be that bellies, which probably average in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 cents a pound, will all of a sudden become worth 30 to 40 cents a pound. And maybe not even that, because the country will then have three times as many pork trimmings as it had before. And you may find yourself in a position where trimmings cannot be merchandised at any price. So it's of grave concern to all of us uh, from just a pure economic standpoint. It's also of grave concern to us for we can see a mentality developing in Washington where 
These types of scares are becoming more and more abundant, and the numbers that we're having to talk about become more and more ridiculous, and we wonder what, uh, what is the, the sense of our having to spend this kind of time and energy on these problems. It's difficult enough to do business on a daily basis considering market conditions, considering labor problems, considering weather conditions, considering all the, the, the problems that we have without having to continually defend ourselves in the public arena with regard to, to statements as ludicrous as bacon might be dangerous to your health. So we're very much concerned about it, and we hope that we can motivate you people and hopefully motivate Secretary Berglund to stop the kind of bad publicity that we've received to stop spending our money needlessly on trying to explain to people that if they eat 40,000 pounds of bacon, they might uh, have some problems. And hopefully we'll be able to achieve this through this meeting this afternoon. In any event, I've enjoyed uh, the time I've had to spend here with all of you. I hope that you'll continue to produce hogs in, in greater and greater abundances in years to come so that we'll be assured of a supply of animals in the years to come because that's necessary not only for your success, but for ours too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to uh, take Dr. Haverkamp and Mr. Dew and Mr. Dorfman, myself and Merle, and we're going to go over and meet with the Secretary of Agriculture and discuss this problem with him. I'm going to, at this point, turn the meeting over to Cecil here. He's going to talk about the plan that we have laid out to put the cost of production together, to put the contract together. He is going to read the cost of production contract to you uh, as we have it written. And at that point, we're going to have to make a decision as to just exactly what we want to do with it. Because if we were to use a bottom line program on this, we would find that there's 2,700 hog producers have come through this meeting hall today. If those 2,700 people will go home from this convention a week from tonight, we could come back here to this hall or to the Veterans Auditorium in Des Moines and price hogs. 2,700 producers, if each one brought seven, those of you that were here earlier, you know we use 10. But if each of these 2,700 producers brought seven people back to Des Moines and Veterans Auditorium, you would have better than 35% of all the hogs in the United States in that meeting. The question that we have got to ask ourselves before we leave this convention is whether or not we have got the courage to get on a telephone, call seven neighbors, and ask them if they will come to Price Hogs. We are going to call that meeting to order if and when we compile that list of people. Think of it. One auditorium, we can put it together. Now, that's why I say it's possible, that's why it can be done. The other point that I want to make, and I'm going to go over and meet for about 10 minutes and then I'm coming back, but the other point that I want to make and the type of meeting that we have here is simply this. Is there any man or woman that has ever been in a meeting where you have had as many packers on one stage for one purpose and one purpose only and make no mistake about it? They came here to buy hogs not peanuts, not marshmallows or bananas, but they came here to buy hogs from you as organized producers. <laughs> now folks, you have on this stage, you have three of the largest packers in the United States, you have the world's largest independent, and you have the world's largest major. That tells you one thing. You have come of age. You have been accepted. Cecil is going to go through a plan that will put this in perspective because as we look at it, you talk about a $5 million a day business. It sounds phenomenal and untouchable. 
but that is not the case, as you will see when he unwinds this structure and this plan. You have also on this stage two of the industry leaders, one from Pig America, Pig International, that have brought as many innovative ideas into hog production that I've seen in a long time. That's a quite a magazine. You have a representative from the National Pork Producers who is trying a different angle to price hogs. I really don't care how they come about, but all I want to do is get them priced, and I want to get it done in 1978, and I want these people in front of me to have enough guts to go home, and if it has to be, come back in a week and say, this is the price, and we're going to go forward from here. But it's going to take the horses. So at this point, we're going to go over and talk to the Department of Agriculture, and I'm going to break in a, from that meeting if I have to and come back and talk to you for about five minutes before we adjourn here before five o'clock. So hang loose. We'll probably get a feel for uh, what his position is going to be on this because as a former uh, research student and a graduate student at the university, you can take this Delaney mem Amendment, which says ha you've got to have zero tolerances on nitrates and improve the efficiency of your test, and you're not even going to be able to breathe this air because it's going to be illegal. That's all bullshit, folks, and we've got to go and talk to them. Now, first of all, I want to ask you if you can all see this. Can everybody see it? Okay. As we said, this is the plan. Going to 1976, last fall, we came out with the commitment to bargain, and I'm sure that most of you here worked on it. You put three, between three and four million of head of hogs on an inventory that was an inventory of not only hogs, but people. People who believed they could price hogs. From that inventory, the negotiators went to the industry and worked out interim supply contracts, to which I believe most of you are putting hogs through under. Some of those contracts have been renegotiated. Some of them are being renegotiated. Now, we're right here. All right, the next step is a hog contract for members. We'll come to that in a little bit. The next step is a cost of production clause in those contracts. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what Alan was talking about. When are we going to do it? We're going to do it when we have enough hogs to say, here's the supply. And that is the plan. That is where we went from, and this is where we're going to. The flexible marking options for you is the hog contract for NFO members. NFO negotiators have negotiated written and verbal contracts for NFO members to consider in their marketing plans. This contract will be, in essence, a contract that hogs can be moved through to the place where they will get, for the producer, the largest amount of money. Right now, we have the live merit sales with graders assisting the producers in determining which way his hogs will bring the most bucks. Some of you have it, don't have the graders at your collection point. Many of you do. And as we work into this, we'll have more and more graders there to do the job. We also have the grade and yield sales. And these graders can assist you in determining whether or not your hogs will work best as for the money. We also have the forward contracting. Forward contracting allows the producer to sell his hogs on a forward market without any margin money. You don't have to go and put up some bucks, and when the market changes, you go ahead and either watch it go the right way, or if it goes against you, you put up some more bucks. 
In this, you just forward sell your hogs. When it comes time, you deliver. Make no mistake about it, you deliver. The hogs are sold. And that, folks, is the plan and the program that we have going right now. Uh, I'd like to get into the uh, contract. And so if I can have the overhead lights, Bill. Hug contract for National Farmers Organization members. An interim supply agreement in behalf of NFO members based on purchase of hogs by various packing companies. The intent of this agreement is to provide NFO members with a hog marketing and bargaining tool that will assist them in their drive to secure cost of production under contract. The terms of this agreement are a result of contracts negotiated with buyers by NFO in behalf of its members. This enables all NFO members in any given area to participate equally with quality and weights considered, and the benefits of all buyer contracts secured. This agreement for the area will begin upon ratification by NFO members through the comp completion of a valid contract for sale with hogs in sufficient amounts to meet volume requirements. Various packers have agreed to buy an NFO in behalf of its members has agreed to sell approximately 100,000 head of hogs per week. Day of run will be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. NFO members shall schedule hogs with appropriate person so that the NFO hog department may schedule hogs with buyer by 12 noon of the last business day prior to the operation of the collection point. The agreed price formulation will be established the day prior to operation of the collection point whenever possible. Live base price at the collection point for a normal consist of one to three butchers shall be based on the collection point negotiated price. Such base may be adjusted to secure a normal consist of one, two, and three hogs according to the normal regional history. Live merit premium will be paid on one and twos in most areas. Live base price shall be on hogs two to 230 pounds. Weight discounts shall be as follows and can be changed based upon current market conditions. On the 170 to 180 pound hogs, there would be a break, 181 to 190 a break, and 190 to 200 a break. Two to 230 base hogs and 10 pound breaks to 300 after that. Sow live base price shall be on 270 to 300 pounds. Weight discount schedules shall be as follows and can be changed based upon mer current market practice. 3 to 330, 330 to 360, 360 to 400, 4 to 450, 450 to 5, 550 to 5 to 550, and 550 to 6, and then all others 600 and up. Grade and yield and live base by base weight shall be the same. Weight discounts shall be the same as live buy unless other arrangements are made with the buyer. The base costs of production formulation shall be as follows. Now, cost of production, and maybe we can leave the lights on and I can use the overhead too, Raj. Let's see if I think it will. I want to kind of put this out. This will get a little bit heavy if I don't get it written down. Uh, and I don't know, I like calling Roger to do this. Roger, can you take this part of it? Th this gets a little heavy for me too, folks, and I want you to understand it right. Here's the man that can do it. I want you to talk about this cost of production right here. The base cost of, base cost of production formulation. Can, can you give that to him? Can you not put up with this dummy, because Merle is the guy that really put this together. The cost of production formula. Now, we have the feeder pig price. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think maybe I better start up a little higher because I'm running out of space. Let's take the feeder pig. What'd I do? Do it again. I'll pull her down now. 
Okay, Peter Pig prize. Okay, now we're going to number that one. Okay, then we have the corn prize for bushel. Okay, we'll number that two. Equals, or excuse me, times number of pounds to reach market weight. Okay, we're going to mark that number three. Okay, now we have the soybean meal. And that's price per pound. Times number of pounds. Times number days to mark. We'll take that times. Look, this is six, and this is seven. I, okay, right. This is four here, and this is five. Thank you. Okay, now I did that uh, so that we could uh, kind of use the numbers. So, in order to reach a reasonable cost of production, Please turn the tape over to side number two for continuation of the speeches. I, know, I think that's a mistake there. Nine and three quarters times the, oh yeah, the cost of production equals, uh, equals not a plus, nine and three quarters times the cost of production. So there would be your formulation. Did everybody pick that up? Okay, if you've got a piece of paper, you might make a copy of it. In other words, you take and your overhead. And that would equal the price of a hog divided by the average market weight that would give you your price per hundred weight. And that would be the cost of production clause that would be put in, that is in this contract. Uh, now, the standard, yeah, in other words, I'm sure all of you saw the cost of production sheet here. This is basically what we're talking about. We've got it worked out here for any of you that want some copies. We've got a lot of them to work out. Also, we have this brochure that maybe many of you have, maybe some of you don't. You pick it up. There's a copy of that. <coughs> that you can work out on the inside. Okay, to go on with it, the standard carcass yield shall be as follows. Now, as you all know, right now, in the industry, there are no standards. The grain yield thing is a house condition. It's like everybody establishing a game, setting their own rules, and inviting people over to play it and they, they run the rules. That's what grade and yield is. We have packers who run on various standard yields, various ways of measuring a number one, two, and three hog. Some of them don't even measure it that way. They just measure the thickness of fat and call it a number. But however it's done, it's done in a way to find the value of a quality animal. But there's no standard. This would have a standard carcass yield schedule. This agreement shall remain in force with each producer un until completion of produce producer's contract for sale. At the fulfillment of the producer's contract for sale, the producer shall be ex asked to expand his co NFO contract by committing the next block of hogs that will be marketed. 
Neither the buyer nor the NFO members will be bound to the terms of this agreement during the period of time that they are unable to abide by the specific terms due to circumstances arising from act of God, breakdown, strikes, pickets, lockouts, NFO members holding actions, or a work stoppage beyond normal control. This agreement shall be immediately adjusted at any time the NFO meet custodial account credit department determines that payments are not being received from buyers in acceptable time limits or information received from Dun & Bradstreet or other responsible industry sources indicate a material adverse change in the buyer's financial status. Payment will be made by buyer by wire transfer transmitted not, late than the next, not later than the next business day following delivery of hogs to buyer and determination of the purchase price made payable to the NFO meet custodial account, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Unless the buyer makes other arrangements with the NFO credit department, payment will be made to NFO members by check or draft at collection point on 100% basis for live buy and an option of 80% on grade yield if requested. Final payment on grade and yield to be made when received from buyer. Buyer will provide NFO with information relating to each lot of grade and yield hogs, its slaughters originating from purchase, purchases under this agreement, including all carcass merit kill sheets and live buy kill sheets. This enables NFO representatives to work with producers in developing their breeding lines. The intent of this contract is to block sufficient numbers of hogs into marketing patterns to standardize weights, price grade, and yields, and establish a cost of production formulation. The slaughterer and NFO representatives will meet periodically for the purpose of promoting the orderly and most economic delivery of hogs to various slaughtering plants. And at the bottom of this, the various packers that we have on contract will sign the original copy. Now, there's an attachment to this uh, that this referred to, and this is that formulation that I'm going back to. <coughs> Excuse me. Feeder pig price. Price to be based on the average IPLA auctions quotes. 40 to 50 pound pigs for the day prior to the day hogs are marketed. In addition, a basis for each plant would be negotiated on an interim basis. Corn price, price to be based on the Chicago Cash 2 corn the day prior to the day the hogs are marketed. In addition, a basis for each plant would be negotiated at an interim base. Number of bushels to reach market weight to be based on the weight most desired by the processor and the enclosed feed requirement chart. We have a chart on that. The soybean meal price per pound to be based on Decatur Cash 44% soybean meal divided by 2,000 the day prior to the hogs are marketed. In addition, a basis for each plant would be negotiated on an interim basis. Number of pounds of soybean plus supplement to reach market weight would be based on the weight most packers desire and the enclosed feed requirement chart. Cents per day overhead to be based on a negotiated standard rate or on custom feed or on custom feeding operations. In addition, a basis for each plant would be negotiated. This portion of the formula includes the following direct costs: veterinarian medicine, marketing, power and fuel, labor, miscellaneous breeding supplies. Uh, also include the following direct cost, building and equipment, depreciation, interest de on investment, maintenance, taxes, insurance, death loss, administration, and management. Number seven, number of days to reach market weight to be based on a 40-pound feeder pig to the weight most desired by the process, the enclosed daily chart, gain chart. Then uh, it has enclosed the chart on uh, feed requirements is uh, 
included here. This is by the Extension Service, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the National Pork Producers Council. Pork producing systems with business analysis determining capital requirements April of 77. And there's a chart of that in here which you can achieve from uh, the Extension Service. Also in here is a uh, Extension Service, U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, and National Pork Producers Council, the pork producing s production system with business analysis determining cash uh, capital requirements. Uh, there's a chart in here on that. And so that's where these costs came from. And that is the contract. Now I'd like to get on a little bit of a light subject. How about if, if everybody would uh, just think a minute wouldn't you give a penny for the thoughts of the Secretary of Agriculture right now? <laughs> be kind of interesting to know how he feels at this time. I don't think that he intended to come here and be confronted by the people that have walked in there to sit down and visit with him. They're the same people who came here, though, to originally only visit with us. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. They came here to visit with you people, the producers. They didn't come here to see him. Because you're just as important, if not more so, than he is. We've got an industry that we have. We can keep it. We can do whatever we want to with it but we have to do it together. Alone, we cannot. Now, instead of getting back a little bit, I think you'll get here. Sure you will. Here we are. Now, we talked about our plan. We talked about our contract. And Alan talked to you just a minute before he left about what we had to do and whether we were ready to do it. Alan is, the staff are, I believe the industry is. That only leaves one part of the whole thing, and it'll all fit, folks, and that's the producer. Is the producer ready? That's the question. And if he is, when? That's the other question. Won't do any good to make a plan, doesn't do any good, to have everything ready to go. It's kind of like starting your car up and let it run out in front of the house until it runs out of gas. Because if you don't get in it and drive it somewhere, well, it won't do any good. There's no use of calling a taxi until you're ready to leave. So the plan is here, the industry is ready, and the people to carry it out are ready. We need the hogs. We need the producers. And as Alan was talking just before he left, that's what's left, is the producers. And the structure of the producers, uh, he said it a little differently, but this is what it all is about. We've got 2,700 hog producers in town, or people who are interested enough to pass through the hog department at this convention. Okay, you can use any figure that you want to. You can go at it any way you want to. But there's about 8,800 counties in these United States that produces hogs. Or townships, I mean. Now, if each person brought one more producer, if we got one producer, get active and want to do something in each township, and he went and talked to another producer and adjoining him to do it, you would have 19,200 producers, and that's winning it by default. Or you can do it the way Alan said, the 2,700 that have been here go home and get seven. That's all. 
get the seven. This is the way we look at it, that if we could find one person in every township that would want to buy price hogs, wouldn't take him very long to find the other guy and there'd be enough of us. We've got a structure out here. We need hog coordinators to make this thing flow. There it is. You take those townships and that one producer coordinates his hogs and one more, he's got it. So any way you go at it, it's no big task. The people are here that can do it. The people are out there that will help you. But we have to move it. We know we're the leaders of the industry because we're here. You're informed. And it's our industry. And it's just a matter of when we decide we want to make it happen. Well, there's one thing I wasn't supposed to do, and I speak from the podium today, but I guess it's my turn now. Uh, as far as the report from Agriculture Secretary uh, Berglund, there is no report at this time. Uh, we are going to be meeting with him in groups uh, in just a few moments. Uh, we were delayed from some other NFO meetings and press conference. Uh, we are assured that we, in fact, we are kind of like standing in line to meet with him. Let me rest you assured you will be heard from not only the National Farmers Organization, but also three packing companies today that processes somewhere between 60 and 85,000 head of hogs per day. That's what you had sitting on your stage here this afternoon. I don't know I could wind this story up in many, many ways, but I think to do it the simplest is to let you know as a negotiator of your organization that you have been accepted totally by the industry. We no longer have to prove the point that what we can do as an organization. The one gentleman from Armour and Company flew in here today special because of an invitation. He didn't have to, main stretch of the imagination, but he's concerned also about American agriculture, even though when you're sitting on a telephone with him trying to sell him hogs or sitting in around the desk negotiating for a contract with him, he's not that type. And if I was a packer, I'd steal them from you people just as long as I could. I used to raise hogs myself. And so long as the farmers in this America and this country won't stand up and be counted, and if I was a packer, and if I could get you to give me the hogs, chuck them to my plant, and spend about a half a day there to kill them for me, I would let you. Talking about it being efficient, we're efficient in this nation. You've seen up here when Dr. Haverkamp was up here that we took the hogs in the past 10 or 12 years from 13 pounds of lard per 100 pounds of weight down to just a hair over five pounds of lard for every 100 pounds. We've increased our efficiency to about a 69 to 70 percent standard yields up to the, the packing industry now has clear up to 74 percent standard yields. We have given them 4 percent of standard yields and 4 percent of standard yields today at 50 cents of, uh, is two bucks. So each one of you guys today just take two bucks out of every pocket, free gratis, no strings attached, take it out of your pocket, because that's exactly what we've done, and handed it to someone else. Just on your efficiency. But also the packing industry's gotten efficient. The young man, Joel Dorfman, I met with him and his plant several times in the past few years. We are working out negotiation with him. Hopefully before they leave this convention, we could possibly even have a signed contract with them. It's actually that close. It's up to you people how much you want to back your own programs and put a price on your hogs. I think Ellen Scrawl has laid out in this convention and Cecil Connery has laid out in front of you here this afternoon. We do have a program. You've been accepted. 
the organization's grown up, and it still is the one thing, the one vital thing that we're missing. And it was missing the day of September the 9th, 1961, when I joined this organization. I joined it for that reason, to put my production with yours where I could set a price for my product. Because those Alan Scrawl sons, you add about two years on each one of his sons, and those are my three sons down there. I've got three of them also. I've got one to be graduating from high school this year, but I know a lot of personal friends of mine that's coming back on the farms now. Their fathers are staying at home and doing chores, and I see a lot of fathers that I know have stayed home and done chores, and their sons have come to this convention. Because those sons have got some responsibilities, they've got the know-how, they've got everything there is to be done with, except for a price for their product, and you are the people that's responsible for helping them get it. And I am also. Because every time I point a finger out there, I got three pointing back at me. But I think I'm not going to get real hepped up and all roused about it because I can stand here and scream bloody murder and I can pound this podium and I could go through all that ramifications. But it's up to you and I to solve our problems. And we can go there and we can talk to Berglund and let me assure you it's going to happen. But if you think that our government at this point in time is going to flock back in this convention and say, oh yeah, gee whiz, you bunch of nice guys. It's not going to happen that way. And I think you all realize it, but there's one thing that we all kind of hate to do, and that's commit ourselves. Commit ourselves. And you people, we, and you, and I, we commit ourselves every day of our lives to something. Every morning when we get out of bed, we commit ourselves to go to work, to go do the farming, we put our crops in the grounds with the good Lord's help. We commit ourselves for six months or a year to harvest them. We put a bunch of hogs in the feedlot. We commit ourselves for 90 days, put a bunch of cattle in the feedlot, maybe six months, eight months. We commit ourselves every time we turn around. You commit yourself when you walk out the door. What is so difficult about committing yourself to work with your neighbors to set a fair, fair price for agriculture where we don't have to be like some of the other countries when agriculture goes down the drain, that we have to live and be in the same position that some of the other countries have. And as far as I know, and the best of my knowledge, every country in this America, I mean in this world, that's ever went broke through agriculture has been by the raw product. And God gave you the raw product first. Why don't you take care of it? Why don't I take care of it? It's a God-given gift to each and every one of us. And I think it's high time we cultivate it and do what we should be doing with it. So with that, you will have a report on our meetings. You will be excused now. We will have a meeting on tomorrow afternoon when Alan Scroll gives the hug report. You will have a report on our meeting here today. Thank you.